This is a special feature produced for download from ABC Classic FM's website. Due to copyright restrictions on the music, it's been edited to make this possible. Hello there, Margaret Throsby with you. Midday interview time on ABC Classic FM, Radio Australia and online. Overnight, news came through of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry being awarded to three researchers who've opened a new world through their invention of a microscope with much sharper vision than was ever thought possible. It allows scientists to study diseases of the brain like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and Huntington's at a molecular level. And we'll hear why this is so important today from our guest, who's a leading researcher into Alzheimer's, Professor Ash Ashley Bush from the Florey Institute in Melbourne has been working on the causes of Alzheimer's for many years. It's hard, painstaking work, and the direction of his research puts him, I think, at odds with mainstream thinking. This year, Ashley Bush won the 2014 Victoria Prize for Science and Innovation, and he can lay claim to being the most ci highly cited neuroscientist in Australia. So during this Mental Health Week, it's time, timely that we open up a discussion into Alzheimer's. Professor Ashley Bush is our guest, and the music that he's uh, selected for us contains some really beautifully moving pieces. This lovely, very short song by Robert, Sch Robert Schumann. Ich Und wenn das Herz auch bricht, ewig verlohne Sieb, ewig verlohne Sieb, ich grolle nicht, ich grolle nicht, wie du auch strahlst in die Pracht. Es fällt kein Strahl in deines Herzens Nacht, was weiß ich längst. Ich grolle nicht, und wenn das Herz auch bricht, ich sah dich ja im Traum. The voice of Olaf Bear with Jeffrey Parsons at the piano. And that song from Dichterliebe by Robert Schumann, Ich grolle nicht, I blame you not. And it was the first, first choice of our guest today, Professor Ashley Bush. Ashley, welcome to our program. Oh, thank you very much, Margaret. It's a pleasure. Short and sweet, but a beautiful song, wasn't it? It's beautiful and very painful. Why do you say time. that? Well, it is a, it's a song about rejection. What it means, Ich grolle nicht, means I don't blame you. And it was written as a response to a romantic rejection. And uh, Robert Schumann was, uh, had a life full of excessiveness and uh, was particularly uh, affected by bi bipolar disorder and took things pretty heavily, pretty badly in his life, mm. ultimately uh, dying in an insane asylum of the effect of, uh, effects of syphilis, uh, having been earlier in his life quite a carouser. What, what rule of thumb did you apply when we asked you to choose music for today? Well... This uh, song, as all the songs I've chosen, are, is in honour of Mental Health Week. And this particular song, of course, apart from the fact that it was composed by uh, a genius who was severely affected by a, a mental health disorder, um, also is important for us uh, in the medical research community because it expresses a sentiment that can disturb our mental health as well, and that is the process of rejection, which mm. is a big part of the scientific odyssey. Yeah. And you mentioned in, uh, in your opening remarks about uh, the Victoria Prize and the Nobel Prizes, and you're, you're seeing the acclaim. But behind that, there's a tremendous amount of rejection. Most scientists learn to cope with failure. And, uh, for example, uh, as an ordinary career event, we, we fail in the publication of our papers and in the acceptance oh, of our grants. I hadn't thought of that. And Well, getting, getting the grants is the hard one, isn't it? And mm. on them you depend, really. That's, uh, that's exactly right. I'd like to pick your brain on that a bit later, on more on that, because it's a side of your work as a scientist and 
scientists in general, researchers, that perhaps the public doesn't think about too much, that, you know, you're not, it, it, you're not going off to the lab every day secure in the knowledge that the funding is going to continue forever and ever. So we'll talk about that a bit later, but can we start with Alzheimer's because that's the focus of our conversation and it's the focus of a lot of people's attention and concern. Do you think of Alzheimer's as a mental disorder? Well, it's most certainly a mental disorder in the sense that uh, it's a disease of the brain that affects cognition, the functioning of the brain. And uh, it is a dementia. And the word dementia, the ment, is from the same origin as mental. I see. So the ability to think, and that's what deteriorates in Alzheimer's disease. How common is Alzheimer's amongst all the dementias? It's the most common cause of dementia. It represents about 80% of diagnosis of dementia. And how is it diagnosed? I remember years ago doing an interview about Alzheimer's and being told, I think, if I remember correctly, that the only way you could positively identify Alzheimer's was post-mortem. Is that still the case? Well, that is still the case, unfortunately. We still don't have a diagnostic test that uh, guarantees that the diagnosis that we're dealing with is Alzheimer's disease. Does it matter? Yes, it does matter because uh, we need to come up with treatments. Hopefully there'll be drug therapies or other therapies for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So we have to understand the biochemistry that's behind it. So it might be different from a multi-infarct dementia then? That's exactly right. So there are, there are many other causes of dementia, and you mentioned one there which has to do with uh, strokes. Uh, there can be brain tumours, endocrine disorders, infections. HIV is a famous cause of uh, dementia. But by and large, if you live long enough, the risk for Alzheimer's disease becomes predominant. So representing about 10% of people over the age of 60. Which is over the age of 60, yes. which is very relevant in an ageing society, isn't it? Exactly. Why is your research not continuing along the lines of everybody else's in the mainstream? What have, what have you done that's different? Well, the mainstream has been uh, nibbling away at this problem since the mid-80s, where the discoveries of Colin Masters and George Glenner led to the purification of a protein out of the brain, which Alzheimer first saw down the microscope in 1906. This is the famous amyloid protein. And the protein was identified for the first time ever in nature on the basis of purifying it um, out of the material that would not dissolve in the affected cases. When you look down the microscope, what you see is this sort of measle-like uh, collection of this protein, which was always thought to be abnormal. And of course, we're all born with normal proteins. There's 50,000 different types of protein. This one particular one collects in the brain to uh, a substantial amount and can be seen down the microscope. So it was thought in the mid-80s that having identified that protein, if it were possible to stop it from congealing, that you would have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. It was a very simple idea. Because in the brains of, of Alzheimer's patients after they died was found, is this right, was found these, these plaques that mm -hmm. people said, now that's what's interfered with the function of the brain, that's what's caused Alzheimer's. Is yep. that right? That was the version one of the theory. And that was the amyloid uh, protein that you're talking about. That's right. What did you find that was a bit different from that? Well, there's, there are a number of problems with the amyloid theory, the plaque theory. Uh, number one, there's a disconnect between the appearance of this aggregation, this uh, conglomeration microscopically in the brain, and the onset of the symptoms. So you can be perfectly normal and have quite a lot of this in your brain. And so you, you do not have dementia, you do not have any cognitive loss. You mean you can have um, clumps of it, as in, right. a, as in a plaque? About 50% of people over the age of 50 have got these clumps. Huh. But obviously only a minority of them have got Alzheimer's Does disease. Does it matter where the clumps occur? Well, the clumps occur within the regions that are obvi of obvious importance for thinking and, and memory. Uh, the, the outer parts of the brain that we call the cortex. Mm -hmm. So what did you discover? What did you, what, what did you put into this equation? Well, the, the old theory was the mere generation of this protein was enough to cause the disease. And I thought that didn't make sense because children make this protein and there's no evidence that this protein is being overproduced in Alzheimer's disease. In fact, when you sample biological fluids, like through a lumbar puncture, for example, the levels of this protein are decreased. So I suspected a second gunman, basically. And what I looked at was what, are the, what is the um, biochemical milieu in which this 
protein operates and discovered very early on now, it's more than 20 years ago, that it reacts with zinc. And uh, th this was work that was in my PhD with Colin Masters, actually, and then shortly afterwards at Harvard Medical School, I found this very striking chemical reaction. And it led to the question, is, why is there zinc in the brain? No one really knew much about this. But aren't we told we should take zinc for brain function? Well, if you're deficient, it's a bad thing. Mm. But and being exposed to too much of it doesn't cause Alzheimer's disease. We know that too. But what it opened up was this whole world of the neurochemistry of metals, which was largely unknown. Metals. When, metals. Metals. Your brain consists of very high concentrations of metals. Really? And which ones? Zinc? Zinc, iron, copper. They're the major ones. And there are concentrations which are really very impressive. And they're shuttled in and out of the brain cells very rapidly, and they perform innumerable essential functions. So we need them. We need them. And if you have, a, for example, a mutation of one of the systems that move it in or out of these nerve cells, you can come down with a very severe brain disease. Okay, so do they somehow act or react or do something with the amyloid? So that was the, that was the discovery. Just zinc or does copper and, and what was the other one? Iron. Iron. Do they also have a... Well, zinc was the predominant one. That kicked it off. But then, now with the benefit of a couple of decades of work on this, we understand that the proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's disease, and there's a, there's a handful of them through that genetics has told us, genetic studies have told us, are relevant. But the genetics only tells you what's relevant. It doesn't tell you how that gene and the protein attached to it causes a disease. Mm. So the body of work that's been coming out of my laboratory has been to, to show that these proteins normally function to handle these metals, to move them from one part to the other for their essential purpose. And what happens in Alzheimer's? In Alzheimer's disease, well, even before Alzheimer's disease, as you get older, the trafficking of these metals fatigues. So the pumps fail and the, the metals accumulate on the wrong side of uh, the fence, as it were. So in the case of amyloid, the zinc accumulates first and that we believe this causes the amyloid then to congeal and trap zinc. And when it does that, it deprives the nearby nerve cells of the zinc that it needs essential, uh, that's essential for its function. So it's a, it is, as it were, a theory which says the proteins are not they're not the cause of the disease alone, that it's the loss of their ability to do their normal job to move these metals around that contributes in large part to the disorder. In certain people, in people who are going to get Alzheimer's, but why doesn't it happen in other... I mean, I was thinking as you were talking then, maybe this is just a, fun, a, a, a symptom of ageing, of decaying actually, decaying. Mm -hmm. Everything decays eventually. Mm -hmm. Every every living thing decays. Mm -hmm. The tree that's mm -hmm. been standing for 400 years gradually dies and goes back to the earth. Mm -hmm. And human bodies could be said to do the same thing, wouldn't mm -hmm. they? Oh yes, indeed. This is why I have uh, an important part of my group is a, is a worm lab, a worm, a, a lab that studies roundworms. It's oh. led, led by Gavin McCall. And I've invested quite a lot in, in just studying why worms die at all and what happens to their metal chemistry as they age. And you indeed, reckon it's the metal chemistry? Yes, well, indeed, it changes. And you can okay. see that senescence itself, as you say, the loss of function as you get older, is accompanied by the breakdown of these pumping mechanisms. So it's like a, something rusting. Exactly. And do you think that it can be, I mean, can it be prevented or reversed, do you think? Well, we've certainly shown that that's the case with uh, uh, mice, for example. We work with uh, mouse models of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and we've shown How that... How can you tell whether a mouse has got de dementia? I mean, do you, do you breed them specifically? Well, there's two ways. First... Because he gets forgetful <laughs> and he doesn't do the maze as well as he was yesterday or something. Well, that, that happens. As mice get older, or rats as they get older, they lose their cognitive abilities. They become less acute. They, mm. they can't do the maze as well. And we give them tasks and we time them and we, we measure their performance. And we can see that at their equivalent of um, seniority, that they lose their function. And we can 
reverse that by intervening with these metals. Oh, so we can take and this is the fountain of youth you're talking about, is it? Well, you know, we always hope that it's going to, we're going to be able to <laughs> translate it from the, the a rodent into uh, into, a, into human. a human. But that that's a very big step. And we've tried. We, we've had some pretty good shots of goal in terms of studies in, in humans. But as I said earlier, this is not a mainstream theory. It doesn't have the backing of big pharma yet. But I think they're beginning to, to wake up to the possibilities. Very interesting. I think we'll listen to some more music from your list. And you've chosen, as I said, beautiful pieces. This is one of the Kindertortenlieder by Mahler. Tell me about this. Well, Mahler is my favourite composer. And... Um, the uh, Kinder Toten Lieder uh, means songs for dead children. And uh, it is one of the most striking examples of uh, music conveying uh, an idea of grief. And um, this particular song from the, there's five songs in the cycle, uh, c concerns the um, parent imagining that their child is actually only outside and is playing and that uh, he or she will be able to, to join her if he can find her on the hill. There's a very sad story that's, that's attached to it, but maybe we could listen to it first and I'll tell you the, the story next. One of the famous Kindertortenlieder leader by Gustav Mahler, that one translates to I often think they're just outside. They've just gone outside, uh, really all about the dead children. And it was uh, chosen by our guest today, Professor Ashley Bush. It's very, it's very sort of um, ambiguous music in a way, isn't it? It's, it's very cleverly put together. I, I mean, I have a lump in my throat just listening to it again. And it's based on the poems of Friedrich Rickert, who lost his children to scarlet fever in the 1830s and wrote 440 poems about it. Mm. And Mahler picked five that he, com he composed the music to shortly after or around the time he got married to his wife, Alma Mahler. And she fell pregnant almost immediately. And they had two little girls. And... Um, when he published the music, and I think it was first performed a few years after the birth of the second daughter, she was absolutely livid. She said, how could you bring the evil eye by writing a song, writing songs about dead children when you've got two little girls? And the astonishing part of the story is that very shortly afterwards, within a couple of years, one of the girls died from scarlet fever and diphtheria. And uh, this was devastating for Marla, for, for the family, and uh, it was devastating for the marriage as well. Um, subsequently, Alma Marla could not forgive Gustav and uh, had a, a famous uh, affair with uh, Walter Gropius, mm -hmm. the, the Bauhaus the architect. architect. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Freud received a letter from Gropius, which was intended for Alma, a love letter, opened it, and within a year he died from the blow mm. but before he died he went to see Sigmund Freud for psychotherapy who Mahler did yes huh. he was uh, obviously extremely depressed about finding out about the affair of his wife and um, didn't want to lose her but was extremely depressed and, and, and could, couldn't function so 
um, he, he managed to track down Freud on his summer holidays in Leiden, in, in Holland, and went to see him and had four hours of psychotherapy walking around the canals in Leiden. And apparently it, it worked a treat, and he went back to, to, Mar, uh, to, to Alma, and uh, they went to New York for a trip, and apparently things were not too bad. But I think he was heartbroken because upon his return from that uh, trip to, to New York, he... He died pretty quickly. Goodness me. What a tra- it's a tragic story, isn't it? Just back to Alzheimer's and your research, are you at odds then with other... I mean, are other scientists still persisting with not looking at metals and not accepting that metals have a role in this? Oh, yes. I, I, I deal with uh, tremendous scepticism all the time. And uh, I've been at it for over 20 years. Have you got any proof? Oh, I've got a lot of evidence, and uh, my work is is taken quite seriously. But the thing about Alzheimer's disease is, obviously, we've got no disease-modifying treatments. We only have symptomatic treatments, which are not going to change how long it takes before you Hmm. you become demented. It buys a little time, but, but doesn't change the eating away of the brain that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. We need something as effective for Alzheimer's disease as, say, statins have been for heart disease. And we're decades behind in our search for that understanding of those drugs. But there have been massive attempts to try to treat Alzheimer's disease, mainly involving focusing on this amyloid plaque theory that I mentioned earlier. And in the order of $5 billion has been spent on gigantic phase three clinical trials. And that's where the bets have gone in terms of the industry that's behind this. Now, I've always said there's more to the story, and and sadly, $5 billion later, it does appear there's more to the story, that those those trials have failed and and shown no benefit whatsoever. So there are many people interested in alternative, respectable theories. I put quite a few papers in the literature about this alternative approach. It's still viable. Mm -hmm. We can make compounds that modify thinking in in animals and we even have had some success in clinical trials with humans with humans so we've actually uh, we conducted a phase two clinical trial so a relatively small one what's the difference between phase one phase two phase three well phase one is the first time it's in humans just to see if it's safe enough and Mm -hmm. roughly what dose it should be at phase two is a dose dose adjustment in a patient so you look for different doses and see if they can tolerate what you might think would be a a, a useful dose Mm. and that phase two you could do all sorts of permutations and combinations to try to get the dosage correct and see if there's any hint of efficacy Phase three is where you try to prove the pudding. So you're going to take a very large number of people. And in in the classic Alzheimer's trials that have been published over the last few years, we're talking about 1,500 people in 30 different locations that have been monitored for 18 months. Hmm. So gigantically expensive exercise. That's why these sort of trials cost half a billion dollars at a shot. Fair enough. But you'd think that the pharmaceutical companies would be onto it like a flash if they thought, because like they did with statins. We heard from an Ebola special the other day saying money hasn't been found to research Ebola and now it's causing such a problem because it's not a sexy disease to to research because it's a third world or it has been a predominantly third world disease whereas high cholesterol is one of the you know flagship diseases of the developed world and the farmers have developed have spent a lot of money on research is it the same sort of thing here or not no it's it's somewhat different Brain research, uh, especially in areas like Alzheimer's disease, where there are no effective treatments, a lot of what happens in terms of research activity from the big money players depends upon opinion. So the opinion was that amyloid plaques was going to be the cause of the disease. And in the, in the absence of evidence that you can actually tackle that, the field is a bit lost now. Yeah, I understand. So it's looking for other things, and I'm hoping that this now will create some interest in the large amount of work that we've put behind this alternative approach. Do you give any credence to lifestyle uh, contributions to Alzheimer's? I'm wondering whether I've read variously over the years that the recommendation of 40 minutes exercise at least three times a week does make a difference to cognitive function. Does Mm. it? Is it provable? 
Yes, it, it's provable and the evidence for that mounts. And so, do we know why? What's, what's going on? So the thing about Alzheimer's disease is a complex interplay between other parts of your body that fail and the consequences for the brain's health. And the most important organ in terms of the health of the brain is the heart. So it turns out the risk factors for heart disease are the same risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, and that's no coincidence. So a big part of what happens as you lose cognitive function with aging and as you enter into Alzheimer's disease is related to the ability of the heart to perfuse the brain with blood. With lots of oxygenated blood. And this is just common sense, mm. really. What about the idea of intermittent fasting? That's the latest fad with mm -hmm. the five two diet, and people say, "Oh, you lose lots of weight, but you also stave off Alzheimer's." I mean, it's a big claim. Do you think it, it happens? Uh, it's a big claim. There is uh, evidence of that, but not in the clinic. It's more preclinical in animals. But uh, it's an interesting idea. I certainly know quite a few people who've lost quite a bit of weight doing that diet, so, so you'd it's have interesting. To, you'd have to ask yourself whether it's the actual weight loss that mm. has caused the effect mm -hmm. on, or whether it's the actual period of not eating food, Precisely. weight loss or no weight loss, that has the effect on the brain. That's right. And, and obesity and type 2 diabetes are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So you get yeah well that the, I mean that's a that's a persuasive enough argument to keep the weight down but I'm mm. I'm I find it very it's a very interesting whole uh, area so where are we up to now with your research where are you up to well I will make the point that you can do all the right things and still come down with Alzheimer's disease so you can take all the lifestyle advice and still be unlucky. So if just, your mother and father or aunts and uncles were, is it, is it a family, is it a genetic thing? It, it increases the risk. There are mutations, which represent the small proportion of total cases. There are mutations that cause inherited Alzheimer's disease. And you can test for the gene uh, in the womb and determine whether or not the, the, the child will get aggressive Alzheimer's disease by, the, by a certain age in the 40s and 50s. From their disability. genetic makeup. Yeah. What about predictive tests? Can you do a test, a blood test of some kind on a 40-year-old and say when you're 75 you've got a 90% chance of getting Alzheimer's? Well, that's, that's uh, the holy grail. Now, I, I, I work at the Flory Institute uh, in partnership with the uh, Australian Imaging, Biomarker and Lifestyle Study of Aging, ABLE, as well as the Cooperative Research Centre for Mental Health. A big conglomeration of researchers have been looking for this and have teamed up with groups around the country, most notably also in Perth, where we've had, we've, we study this longitudinally. We have a large collection of normal people uh, who st we started studying in the year 2006, about 800 people. We've followed them longitudinally since then and they, we take their blood and we measure them and we store the blood if we don't know what we're going to look at yet. How old are they, these people? They'll be in, in their early 60s at, at recruitment when they started in mm -hmm. 2006. So now they'll be 60, so the average six age or seven would be or eight. Six, 70, I think, mm -hmm. now. So um, we follow them longitudinally and we watch them drop off the perch. Then we go back to the blood samples that we've stored of them and see if we can discriminate ah, something at the start that could predict the outcome. Very complex, very important work, but it's the only way we'll get a predictive blood test for Alzheimer's disease. Let's listen to this. This is particularly special to you. It's called a Yiddish mama. What is it? Why are we hearing this? Well, this is a, a nod to my Jewish heritage. My, uh, my mother's favourite song, probably most Jewish mothers' favourite song, this uh, legendary uh, song of love for one's Jewish mother.
A Yiddish Amana. It was written by Jack Yellen, and it's a marvelously sort of longing. It's filled with longing, isn't it, that song? Mm. It was Itzhak Perlman with the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra and chosen by our guest, Professor Ashley Bush. So tell me more about your mother, your late mother. Well, uh, my, my mother was from a family who managed to escape uh, the Holocaust before it came down. Whereabouts was she? She was from Warsaw in Poland. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a child, she came out with uh, many of her, with her parents and many of her un- uncles and aunties. But those who didn't come out all perished. And um, my father also was uh, displaced from events around the war. And they met in Melbourne during the Second World War, which was kind of a, a, a shelter from all of that tumult. But then in the wake of that, uh, the, the losses and the, the trauma that were involved uh, left a, a legacy, and uh, my mother in particular suffered uh, very severely from depression uh, and had issues with survivor guilt, which Did was she? A, a major was it, issue. Was it identified? Well, sadly not. Um, I think that uh, psychiatry, psychology of the 50s and early 60s was not as sophisticated as, as it is now. Uh, She was treated probably inappropriately with some very strong drugs uh, and possibly could have done a lot better just with psychotherapy. If if only you'd known then what you know now, because you're a psychiatrist. um, Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Um, I was born in Melbourne. I was born and educated in Melbourne. And you went to university. Did you, which which university did you do? Melbourne. You, that was medicine you did there. Yes. Then you. I'm just trying to track your course because you ended up in the United States for quite a long period, didn't you? Yes, I did uh, my medical training in Melbourne, followed by uh, specialisation. Uh, originally, I was going to be a surgeon, but I had a, a bit of a problem with being on time, which is a very bad quality. <laughs> you can't in a surgeon. be turned up late for the operation, <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> so I found a vocation that kind of suits that. That, uh, and wound up training in psychiatry. Oh. Did, uh, were you well trained in psychiatry, do you think? Yes. I think the training, the standards of psychiatry in, in Australia and clinical psychiatry are excellent. Mm. So, and, and in fact, it was recognised later on because after doing psychiatry, I, I then wanted to do something about Alzheimer's disease because one of the things that really struck me in my training was how many people were coming down with Alzheimer's disease. And it was part of psychiatry and part of neurology, but no one knew what to do. So you were encountering these people in your practice, were you? That's right. I I trained in the last of the Grand Victorian Lunatic Asylums, Willsmere Hospital, which Mm. is on the hill in Kew, in the bend of the Yarra River, from where comes the expression to go around the bend. Oh, does it? Yeah. So when in Melbourne, when you when you went nuts. You were put on a barge and taken down the river until you disappeared. And that was going around the bend. And that was a, an institution that, when did that, when did it close? It, it was shut, I think, in the early 1990s. So it was part of that thing that I think happened across the country of closing down psychiatric hospitals with the high walls and the, and the locked doors mm-hmm. because of the advances in uh, pharmacological treatment. Is that, is that right? Well, not so much the advances in pharmacological treatment as much as a, a social revolution, the, the appreciation that it's inhumane to lock people into these giant locked wards. Mm. So, for example, I was looking after wards that contained 30 men in them with dementia and they were in their 60s and wandering around. Mm. It, was, it was a degrading way to treat people and I think it was a matter of humanity. To, to come up with something better. So that was the de- deinstitutionalization movement, which I think has added to the dignity of people with dementia. It has its shortcomings, though, I think, doesn't it? Well, there's still the I problem, mean, very idealistically, so. people can live in the community and be part of and, a useful, and have a useful life in the community. Doesn't always happen as well as it should, I don't think, does it? There's still lots of problems. And in order to be able to, to support people with mental disorders in the community uh, it requires a lot of intensive hands-on assistance. Mm. So. We'll take some more music and this is, <laughs> this is kind of changing the pace a bit. It's a, the Stars and Stripes. Tell me about this. Why are we, why are we listening to this? Well, um, 
I, I didn't want everything to be unhappy. I thought that we should talk also about something which brings me a lot of joy. And uh, this particular piece is, uh, is such a, a joyful piece of music, but it's played by a man who is famously unhappy. And this is Vladimir Horowitz. Uh, everyone should be familiar with the music when they hear it. It's also a nod at my 14 years in the United States and at Harvard Medical School. Uh, but at the same time, Horowitz's story is fascinating because he was a man who suffered with depression and it may have been to do with his sexual identity. He actually withdrew from performing many times in his life despite being tremendously gifted and was treated with shock therapy mm -hmm. for homosexuality. And um, we obviously don't do that anymore. And so the story, the psychiatry story behind this piece is actually quite uh, fascinating. wonderful Vladimir Horowitz and his own arrangement of the Stars and Stripes Forever by Sousa, chosen by our guest today, Professor Ashley Bush, and we've been talking about Alzheimer's. Um, what's, what do you think is the time frame for finding a cause? I presume once a cause is definitively identified, then the cure is very close behind it, or a treatment is very close behind. That's the paradox. We won't know the cause for Alzheimer's disease until we have an intervention that actually stops it oh, or slows it down. That's, that's backwards from what it usually is, isn't it? Yeah, but that's, that happens a lot in medicine. Some of the best drugs we have, we don't know how they work. Really? Yeah. And we're taking them. <laughs> yeah. And in psychiatry, that's especially so. So, for example, the drugs for schizophrenia, most of the time, when they originally developed, it was observed how they worked. And to understand the mechanism of what, how they benefit people has taken decades, and we're only really beginning to understand it now. So that's going to happen with Alzheimer's then. In fact, once you, once you perhaps find a drug or a, 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 a something that halts or slows down or reverses the take-up of the metal? Are you talking about that, the rusting well, process? In, in the case of my approach, yes. So, so the scientists of the world assemble themselves into concepts about how you would make a drug candidate. Then you test it. You go out to phase two, phase three clinical trials. Very expensive process and, and hope that it works. Unfortunately, in Alzheimer's disease, we haven't had something work yet at that disease modifying level. That's based upon the mainstream ideas. Will it happen in your lifetime, do you believe? I believe so. I think it's going to continue to take a lot of effort and will take many years. I don't think it's on the horizon. Do you think that this comes down to a matter of knowing not the answers but the questions to ask? Partly, and also partly being able to open your mind up about how complex complex Alzheimer's disease is. It's not simply a sort of one cause disorder. It might be split into multiple causes that look very similar to each other. We have to be, we have to have an open mind. From all the decades of work that uh, I've been involved with and with my collaborators uh, at the Flory as well, I think our approach is to attack it from different angles and see which angle seems to produ produce some fruit and then move it, or move it forward into the clinic to finally test it out. Ashley, we'll have to leave it. It's been most interesting. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having and me. And you've chosen a beautiful thing by Gemma Turvey and Adagio. Tell me what this is all about. Well, uh, Gemma Turvey and the New Palm Court Orchestra is um, a, a relatively new orchestra that I've become involved with uh, as part of uh, next year the board of, of uh, directors. And uh, it's, she's a spectacular young composer. And in the spirit of Mental Health Week, I would want to end with something that's going to bring health to people. I hope that uh, it does make them feel good.
Isn't that lovely? Gemma Turvey and a piece that she wrote called um, Adagio. She was playing there with the new Palm Court Orchestra and it was the final choice of our guest, Professor Ashley Bush. He heads the Oxidation Biology Unit at the Florey Institute uh, in the University of Melbourne. He's a psychiatrist and he's also the Chief Scientific Officer of the CRC for Mental Health. Ashley Bush today and a reminder that this is um, Mental Health Week and to support Mental Health Week, ABC is going mental as. Join us show your support and donate to mental health research today for more information you can visit uh, abc.net.au slash mental as tomorrow um, we're going to be meeting again associate